So our theme this year for Rosh Hashanah is from Joel chapter 2, Blow the Shofar in Zion. Now, throughout the High Holy Days, we're going to be looking at the Book of Joel. It's almost like the Book of Joel was written for the High Holy Days. Uh, so there's this theme of Rosh Hashanah, there's the theme of the Ten Days of Awe, there's the theme of Yom Kippur, and there's even the theme of Sukkot in this, just as a three-chapter book. And so that'll be our outline for the, these whole High Holy Days. And so starting here with Rosh Hashanah, with this blowing of the shofar, Joel chapter 2, verse 1, Blow the shofar in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And so we see it even right here in the very first verse. The blowing of the shofar matching right up with the day of blowing, the Yom Chuam. And the purpose is because the day of the Lord is coming. So to get ready, get ready, it's at hand. Be prepared. It's like uh, Leviticus 23 and, and uh, Joel chapter 2, or just verse 1 is hand in hand. Now, some people think that uh, Rosh Hashanah is symbolic of the second coming of the Lord, but, but obviously from this verse, uh, that is not the theme. I, I know the Lord's come at the last trump, but this is not the last trump. Rosh Hashanah is not the last trump. Actually, Yom Kippur is the last trump. We will blow the shofar again, ending Yom Kippur, ending this time of judgment. And that is more the symbolism of the last day when the Lord comes. But there is this judgment period. So from Rosh Hashanah, this warning time, this get ready time, this, this announcing time, because the Lord is coming. Right? And he's coming soon. Is it at hand? It's very close. You can almost reach out and grab a hold of him. He's there to, you can almost touch him. He's coming so close. And I think that uh, we see that biblically and we see that from the events uh, taking place in the world around us. Uh, there's not much time left. I mean, none of us know how much time we have individually. But as a corporate world, this thing is winding down. And we're getting very close to the Lord's return. It's going to be a day of darkness, verse 2, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like a morning, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. And so things aren't that bad yet. They're going to get really bad. It's going to get real troublesome times, a thick cloud of darkness over this world, a spiritual darkness. Now, there might be times where it might seem like prosperity. They'll say peace and safety. You know, and then this is wonderful. Things might outwardly take an uptick, but spiritually it's just going to get worse and worse and darker and darker. And even maybe outwardly it might look spiritually like things are coming together, a type of unity, but not the unity the Bible talks about. Predicting here a time of darkness and gloominess before the day of the Lord. Still in verse 2, a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them even for many successive generations. And it's in these times of trouble, it's in these times of darkness, that real people of God stand and shine. Oh, it's easy to shine at any time. It's easy to shine and be happy when it's sunny outside and the weather is wonderful. But the real test of faith is in times of gloominess and darkness and troubles in this world. And so God is raising up a people, a people that will be great and strong, such as the world has never seen. I mean, think of mighty warriors that God has used in the past, King David and Moses and, and others down through the ages, Jeremiah, who stood in the midst of troubles and, and were willing to speak God's truth, regardless of who they were speaking to and regardless what the majority of the opinion was. They spoke God's word, a great and strong company of people. Even beyond all of them, such as the world has never been, has never seen, God is raising up a people who will be strong in the Lord and great in his power and in his might. So what are the weapons of this army? That's what we're going to see here in this chapter. What are the weapons that God gives to his people? Not only in this chapter, chapter 2, but, but other places of the Bible as well. Let's look in. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Messiah, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And so there's a lot here, a lot that applies to this very time that we're talking about right here in these last days. We're in the flesh, we're in the world, but we're not to be a part of the world. So we live in the world. That's where we're at. But don't let the world live in us. Right? We're here to shine as lights to the world, not partaking of the world's things and doing like the world does in the entertainment, the amusement, and the practices of the world, but living as peculiar people and not warring as they war. Right? So when they offend us and they abuse us and they misuse us, we don't fight back with the same weapons that they use against us. Not the same cutting down and the, and the gossip and the cursing and the, and the revenge and the anger and the bitterness. We don't wage the same warfare. Our weapons are not carnal, but mighty in God. And they pull down. The weapons of God are strong and they pull down their weapons. They cast down their arguments cast down their lies, expose their lies, expose their falsehoods, expose their false doctrines and crazy ideas and anti-God prophecies and predictions and attitudes and dictates and laws. Cast them down. Cast down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God by bringing every thought, all our thoughts need to be in captivity to obedience to the Messiah. That's how we bring it down, through our mind, through our choices, bringing every single thought, every motive, every action, every word into the obedience of Messiah, fully surrendered to him. And then God will be ready to punish all disobedience. And when can he come with his judgment? When can he come and bring that punishment? When can he bring that judgment upon this world? When your obedience is fulfilled. When God is fully living in us and bringing our lives into harmony with his word. Not just outwardly, but inwardly and starting inwardly and then working outwardly to our surrender to him and allowing his spirit to live in us, through us, and for us. That'll bring conviction upon the world and then God can bring his judgment. When an example of God's word is lived out again in this world. He lived it out when he came here. He wants to do it massively through his army that he is preparing, through his people that he is preparing. That's the weapons. The weapons is a godly life. Back to Joel chapter 2, verse 3. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns, and the land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. So as God's mar army marches on, it has the goal of the Garden of Eden before us. We know our destiny. Know our destination, our goal. There it is, keeping our eyes focused on heaven. Focused on what God has in store for his people. And God's fire of conviction goes before us. His spirit like a flaming fire, burning up the lies, destroying the falsehoods, and leaving it all just vacant and barren behind. Moving forward. Revelation 11 and Joel chapter 2. Well, Joel is a whole and Revelation parallel in a lot of ways. It's why it's perfect for this Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur Sukkot theme. It's Revelation 11 verse 3. I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth 
And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. So this fire of God's word speaking forth, coming forth out of their lips, brings conviction upon the world. God's fire of his judgment to come, devouring the enemies. Back to Joel chapter 2, verse 4. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, like swift steeds, so they run. And with a noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. And before them, the people writhe in pain, and all faces are drained of color. What is it that causes this pain? What type of pain are they experiencing as God's army is going forth like flaming chariots with his fire going forth before them, the fire of his word going forth before them? What is the pain that they're experiencing? What is causing this pain in their faces to drain of color? The pain of conviction. The exposing of their guilt. A pain of heart knowing that they have crucified the Messiah, knowing that their sins will bring judgment upon themselves, knowing that they have transgressed God's law, and that there is a punishment to come for such actions. They have opposed God. They have resisted his conviction. And the pain of heart as it comes upon them knowing what they've lost out on and the fear of God's judgment draining the color from their faces. This is what can lead them to repentance. This can, is, the, is the shofar blow, blowing. This is what the awakening call that can wake them up to, their, to sense their need of deliverance. Sense the need of repentance. Sense the need of confession of sin, of forgiveness of sin, of cleansing of sin, of transformation from sin to righteousness. Starts with a pain of conviction. And it comes forth as God's people live out his word and go forth as a mighty army blowing the shofars, proclaiming his word. Verse 7, still Joel 2. They run like a mighty army, like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. So God's army is on the offensive. God's army moves forward. God's army doesn't wait for them to come to us. But God's army goes against the enemy, goes against the gates of hell, and breaks down the gates of hell and sets free the captives that are there. God's army moves forward unitedly, in formation together, not pushing one another, not who is the greatest, not who, who is known, whose name is known. Not seeing who is sitting closest to God, but moving together, everyone in their gifts, everyone in the talents that God has given them, everyone moving forward with the abilities that God has placed upon them, everyone doing their job, everyone doing their position in sharing God's word with power and might and unitedly working together, marching together in their column, in their ranks, moving forward not sitting back waiting, God, when are you going to show me what to do? God's already showed you what to do. Good, just do it. Hey, go forth. However, whatever, anyone you see, everywhere and anywhere. God's given us the commission. Go forth into all the world and to teach them God's word. We don't need any more instruction. Go. We don't need any more unction. We don't need anything more. Stop waiting. Move forward. Move forward. God has given to everyone a gift and a talent. Stop burying it in the sand. And as we use it, he'll multiply it. So we march forward 
and going against the enemy with their weapons. And even though we lunge forward against their weapons and their lies and their deceit and their accusations and their put downs, it won't affect us. We're not cut down. There'll be martyrs in these last days, but we won't be cut down. It won't matter. We won't care. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they say about us. It doesn't matter how we're despitefully used and misused and abused. It doesn't matter. Because it's not about us. It's about God's word. God's army keeps marching on regardless and does not stop. I mean, here we are, thousands of years later, since Cain killed Abel and tried to wipe out the seed. Down through the ages, one attempt after another of Satan trying to destroy us. And before that, Satan deceiving Adam and Eve, thinking he had it on God, he's going to take away humanity. And yet God's word continues. God's might continues. God's spirit continues. Pogrom after pogrom and crusade after crusade and attempt after attempt to annihilate God's word and God's people. And we're still here and God's word is still here and prospering mass burnings of Bibles and the outlawing of God's word and, 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 and the martyrs and the burning at the stake and pulling asunder and lions and coliseums and God's people are still here. Miraculous, God's army continues on and will not be cut down and will not stop. Verse nine, they run to and fro in the city they run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark. The stars diminish their brightness. God's army running, moving forward, running on the walls, entering into the homes, entering in the windows. How do we get in the windows? How do we get into these homes? How do we get into people's hearts? How do we get into these Gated communities. How do we get in? Shalomadventure.com. <laughs> I'm going to get in, right? Get everywhere. When this gospel is preached in all the world, right, then the end shall come. Right, so we take tracks and we take books and we take flyers and, and we go forth and we use social media and we speak it and we get bumper stickers and every way in any way, get the message out there. Right, and share it. Tell the world. If you're ready, the Lord is coming. There's not much time left. The signs of the times are blaring. We're moving at such a rapid pace that sometimes it feels like we're not moving at all. I like when you're in a plane. You're flying all along hundreds of miles an hour, right? Hey, look out the window, you don't even feel like you're moving. This earth is going so quick, so quickly down that it's absolutely amazing. Every time I I read the real news. It's unbelievable what's happening. Every day it's more tragic. Every day it's more unthinkable, more blatant, and covered up more. And more of the masses just moving along. Nothing to see here. And yet there's everything to see there. I just read and Parents had their child in a hospital. They were drugging him up till she was going blind and couldn't walk. She didn't go in there with that. And they called children. Then they said, they, they offered this drug 10 times the amount that originally spent. And looking at the, 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 the potential side effects, strong side effects of, of, uh, of blindness and all this other stuff. And they said, no, we don't want our daughter getting that. And they called Children Protective Services and took the parents' rights away and gave the kid the drugs. And now the kid is drug blind. It's crazy, this, that is happening in the world today. So rapid. So rapid. Person went into a drugstore, got a shot, and in seven minutes dropped dead. In the drugstore. Two days later, they're continuing to minister, uh, administer this the drugs. Is there anything going to wake this world up? God's people. 
God's word is to wake this world up. Moving so quickly and just ignoring it, just moving ahead. God's word, God's army needs to move forward, armed with the shofar, armed with the power of God's word. Verse 11, the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? So what are the weapons that God gives to his army? Not like the weapons of this world. What is the weapons? The Lord gives voice. Trumpet sound, our voice to his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one, not us, but God. He is the strong one. Great is the one, the strong is the one who executes his word. It's his word on our lips, being sounded forth and being proclaimed. It is his word in our hearts and in our lives. It is his word lived out in our lives that brings conviction. So I Cain hated Abel because he was convicted. Abel's, Abel's life was right. His actions were right and Cain's was wrong. Godly life will speak multitudes, speak volumes and bring conviction. The power of God's word. Just 20 years ago in Palau, this missionary family, family of four, married couple and from Brazil and, and uh, son and their 10 year old daughter were there serving and this man came into their home, killed the father, killed the mother, killed the son, took the 10 year old and eventually tried to kill the 10 year old, left her for dead. Amazingly, she survived. It was national mourning, national grief over it, national shame over it. And at the funeral, towards the end of the funeral, the grandmother stood up and encouraged the nation to forgive the young man, Justin, who did these deeds. And then she invited Justin's mother to come forward. As Justin's mother stood up, his grandmother went and embraced her and hugged her, and encouraged the country to truly forgive and truly love. Not a wishy-washy forgiveness, not a wishy-washy forgiveness that just says, oh, it's okay. Just continue to abuse me, continue to hurt me. No, a forgiveness that says what you did was wrong and it's not right, it's not right here and I'm going to do everything in my power to keep you from doing it to me or anyone else again. But God grants forgiveness and I won't be angry at you. I won't be bitter at you. I won't try to revenge myself upon you. I'll do what I can to stop you from doing it again call the authorities, put you in jail, whatever necessary. I'm not going to wish your harm upon you. I'm going to pray for you. Pray that you will give your heart to the Lord. True forgiveness. 20 years later, a 10-year-old girl went back and visited Palau and making a movie about it. She's given her heart to the Lord. Grandmother went with her. And the young man, Justin, has given his heart to the Lord. And the nation there in Palau still remember it. Crowds of people came out to meet them, to hear the story. The power of God's word, the weapons that God has given to us, the weapons of truth and of righteousness and of love and of forgiveness and of mercy and of holiness and of righteousness and of calling out of wrong, and yet not holding on to bitterness and wrath and rage. True godliness lived out. 
How does the message of God's word for this time? Strong is the one who executes his word. The Lord God Almighty, who gave his son to be a sacrifice for us, to demonstrate that forgiveness, to say, look at what your sins did. Your sins killed my son. You are guilty. And yet he was paid the price for you. He has stood in the gap for you. He has become the substitute for you. He has become the ram caught in the thicket for you. You might receive forgiveness. And through spiritual death, death to self, death to sin, death to the carnal nature, you might receive a new life. Through confession and through repentance, receive new hearts, new minds, and live new lives here and have the promise of everlasting life. That's the power of God's word. That is the strong one who executes his word, who's lived out his word, and who lives it out before his people. It is the Lord who gives us voice. Fear not what you're going to say in that day. We're going to come before judges to testify, and again, we'll be falsely accused and maligned. And our words taken and twisted. Strong is the Lord who gives us voice. God will give us the words to say in that day. Day of the Lord is coming, great and terrible. And who could stand? None of us can stand except for his righteousness, except for his covering over our lives, except for his forgiveness over us, except for his cleansing of us. None of us would be able to stand at that time. It's not in our own deeds. It's not in our own goodness. But him, he, his strong power, he is the one. Strong is the one, the one and only, who executes his word through our lives. Verse 12, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. That's the preparation. That's what prepares us to go forth. That's, what, that's, the, that's the boot camp for God's army. It's prepare your heart with fasting and weeping. Preparation, again, the, the symbolism of Yom Kippur to come. With fasting and with weeping and with mourning. The ten days of awe. Entering into this time of repentance, this time of confession. This time of soul searching. Like David said, Lord, search me and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, open the books. Let me see what's there. Bring conviction to me. Give the gift of confession the gift of repentance, the gift of conviction. Rending of a heart. Not just outward show. Not just a beating of our breast. Not just outward walk. Not just... Tradition and deeds and good deeds and formality. But the heart, I mean the heart ripped in two. Crucified, killed, dead, the carnal nature. And then a new heart placed in. A new mind placed in. New life lived out. For he is merciful and gracious, forgives and cleanses, slow to anger, great in kindness, and doesn't want to do any harm. And that is the message as well. So it's the preparation, and that's the message we preach forth. In verse 14, for who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Send forth that message. Let it sink into the hearts and minds of people that they can turn to the Lord and receive his forgiveness. 
Verse 15, blow the shofar in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babies, let the bridegroom go out of his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Everyone stop what you're doing and come forth and repent. Everyone come forth and pray. Everyone come forth and receive the power of the Lord, a sacred assembly. This is the Shabbat Teshuvah. This is what it's talking about. So blow the shofar, prepare, and then gather people together, come together 10 days to turn our hearts over to the Lord, to come out for Yom Kippur, have our sins blotted out and washed away and cleansed. Call for a fast, call for a gathering, corporately to repent before the Lord. And then the rest of the 10 days, individually and personally and privately, Allowing God to search us, cleanse us, convict us, confessing before him, receiving his forgiveness, receiving his spirit, receiving his power, and moving forward the new life, born anew. And as the Lord brings conviction, going and making it right with others, make it right with God, and then make it right with others. Sure. Have anyone anything against anyone? Ask the God, God to give you godly forgiveness. True forgiveness. Again, not a forgiveness that says it's okay. It's not okay. Forgiveness does not mean it's okay. Forgiveness means it was wrong. <laughs> but I forgive you. But I forgive you. <laughs> Has God to give you the miraculous ability to forgive. And as Yeshua said, if you're on your way to the temple and and you're reminded if someone has something against you, not only you have someone against something else, someone else, but someone has something against you, go and do all in your power to make it right with them. And then come back and get your offering and bring it before the Lord. And so if the Lord brings someone to your mind, someone who's upset at you or someone that you're upset at, Someone who's hurt you, maybe way back past time. Maybe some wrong that you didn't make right. Some debt that you didn't take care of. Let the Lord reveal it to you over these 10 days. And all that's within your power, do what you can. To make it right between God and man. Verse 17, let the Kohanim who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? So praying, praying for the people before you go to them, interceding on their behalf, weeping and crying for them. Lord, save them. Not just looking at the world and condemning the world. Not just looking at others and finding fault. But praying and interceding as the Lord did for us. So he calls us to do for others. Pray and weep, cry. And minister and share. And then when they say, Look at us. Where is their God? As they persecute us, revile us, and narrow is the way. Few there be. Remnant. As the multitude say, where is their God? Like they said to Yeshua, if you be the Son of God, come on down. Show yourself. If he loves you, let him deliver you. Where is your God? As they're persecuting us, casting us out, reviling us, taunting us. Where is your God? Why is he allowing you to be martyrs? Why is he allowing you to die? Where is your God? Our God is not seen in the mighty deeds. God is not seen in the parting of the Red Sea. Our God is seen in the power of the heart, in a life of obedience, life that it doesn't matter what they say. 
Life that's not easily offended. Life that is slow to anger. And abundant in mercy and forgiveness. That is where God is. He's in our heart. He's not in the signs and the wonders. The devil is going to do plenty of signs and wonders. It's not the miraculous signs and wonders that testify of who is really God. Pharaoh's magicians were able to turn their sticks into snakes or make it appear to be. It's in a transformed heart. Power to move forward, to march unitedly, to proclaim God's word even when it's not popular, to proclaim the truth even when it is reviled, to go against the majority when they're wrong like a Noah, standing on God's truth, standing on God's word. That's where God is. He's in a heart that stands for the right, even if the whole world falls. Even when the whole world is going in the wrong direction, that's where God is. God is on the march. When he's lived out in our hearts. And so that's the theme of Rosh Hashanah. The beginning of the theme or one of the themes. From below the shofar. To prepare the world. And to prepare them with our words and with our lives. With the Holy Spirit lived out through us. Not our lives, his life lived out through us. Not our words, but his words on our lips. And so in a moment when we pray, God has brought anything to your mind. Maybe you're not sounding the shofar as God has called you to. Maybe he's empowered you with three talents and you're only using two. God's calling you to proclaim his word in action, in deed, in some method of way. Maybe God's bringing someone to your mind, maybe a specific person to your mind who needs to hear about the Lord. And he's calling you to tell them, give them a book, a gift, a track, an email, a text, a word of forgiveness, maybe an act, a deed. In a moment when we pray, ask God to go before you, to give you his voice, as the trumpet sound will be clear and distinct and awaken them out of their slumber. Secondly, if God is bringing conviction to you, there's somewhere in your heart and mind, some sin in your life that's on the record book, some area of disobedience, some known wrong, some area you know that God's calling you to do and you're not doing or you're doing and you shouldn't be doing, you know it's on your record book. Confess it to the Lord and receive his forgiveness. Receive his cleansing. Receive his power to walk right. To walk in obedience for him. If you're in God's army, but you're not marching straight, you're stepping on other people's toes, you're turning around to see what other people are doing, like Peter walking with Yeshua along the beach and he turns around, what, is, what about John? What's going to happen to John? Yeshua said, don't worry about John. <laughs> it's not about John. I'm talking to you. <laughs> you worry about Peter. <laughs> You're marching out of rank. Worrying about others, gossiping about others. Surrender it to the Lord and get back in line. If you're allowing the wounds of the lies and the put-downs and the negative talk and the peer pressure to slow you down and surrender it to the Lord, the insecurities and the fears, let God heal the wounds. Let God fill you with his love and his security. And the only words that matter is you are his beloved child in whom he is well pleased. And march on. And continue with the goal set before you. If your eyes are on Sodom and Gomorrah and the things of this world, and the car and the house, 
Let it all go. Garden of Eden is before you. Keep your eyes on the Garden of Eden before you. March towards that goal and not the prosperity in the name here in this world, which will all get burned up. And so if there's any areas of this theme of Joel chapter 2 that God has brought to your mind and heart, let us pray and let God work in your life and empower you to sound the shofar. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, ruler of the universe, we're thankful for your word and we're thankful that you've given us this warning. Thank you right in the yearly cycle you've given us these reminder and these 10 days to repent and to get ready for a final day and preparing our hearts and our lives and the finality of our personal lives. Thank you for giving us time and warning to get right before you. Thank you for being willing to open our books and show us what's wrong. Thank you for the gift of conviction. Thank you for the gift of confession and the gift of repentance. Thank you for the gift of the lamb, the ram caught in the thicket. Thank you for the forgiveness. Thank you for the atonement. Thank you for the substitute. Thank you, Yeshua, for your death. Thank you for the new heart, the new life. Touch our lips with your word and sound forth uh, through us with a mighty sound. Make us a great and strong people marching forward for you, doing your mighty deeds by your power and by your grace. And use us in winning souls for your kingdom before it's too late, before the day of probation closes upon them. Use us so that there'll be more people in the kingdom of heaven. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.